Uh, thank you very much, uh, Madam Chair. Thanks for this hearing. Um, you're all doing super important work. We appreciate the testimony. Um, Dr. Delphin Rittman, I wanted to talk to you about um, the, the genesis of the opioid crisis, which, uh, of course, at first is rooted in uh, America's penchant to prescribe opioids and addictive pain medication at a rate that is unparalleled in the rest of the world. We've made a lot of progress when it comes to the overall number of opioids that are um, prescribed in this country. And you know, there is a direct line between individuals who become addicted to these pain medications and then those that end up seeking illicit drugs um, uh, in black markets that often end up having fentanyl um, attached to them. Um, so we've seen this drop in the number of opioids that have been prescribed, and we sort of pat ourselves on the back, and yet when you look at our numbers, even with this drop compared to the rest of the world, we are still a crazy outlier, right? We are still 5% of the world's population and somewhere between 70 and 80% of the world's opioid prescriptions, even with a 40% drop in the overall number of prescriptions that are being um, made. So uh, just talk for a second about, as we're, as we're talking about the fentanyl crisis here, um, the work that we still have to do to alter prescribing patterns as a means to stop people from getting on this pathway to fentanyl. Yeah, you know, thank you for that question, Senator. And, and you know, the, per, the prescribing patterns and, you know, ultimately ensuring that people have access uh, to evidence-based uh, services and supports is so critical. Um, we've seen that over time, and we know that the um, evidence-based practices and treatments such as medication-assisted treatment, whether it be buprenorphine uh, or uh, methadone, uh, can help people uh, who are struggling with opioid-related uh, 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 substance challenges. Um, in terms of prescribing patterns, I mean, one thing that we're working on is uh, to, to increase that access uh, for individuals that may be struggling is uh, to allow individuals, prescribers that is, uh, prescribers to, to treat up to 30 individuals with buprenorphine. Uh, and so we've revised the buprenorphine pa practice guidelines uh, such that those individuals can, can treat individuals uh, struggling with uh, opioid uh, addiction uh, with buprenorphine. But I guess what I'm talking about, right, pain management, I'm talking about the fact that we, we we still are prescribing far more pain medication, addictive pain medication, than the rest of the world. And that we've got to, you know, from your perspective, right, you've got to focus on trying to find alternative ways to manage pain so that people never get in the position of being addicted to pain medication that then becomes an addiction to heroin, fentanyl, et cetera. Yeah. Yes, and we do have grants actually that do that type of training. So for example, our state opioid response grant uh, does train providers on um, alternatives to pain management such that uh, you know, uh, prescription medications aren't the first course. Uh, and so other strategies to manage pain and, and that can help to alter uh, and change some of the prescribing practices that we are seeing. Um, Mr. Chester, I wanted to talk to you a little bit about um, how uh, fentanyl and another and other illicit substances come into the United States through the southern border. Um, it is still true, correct, that the lion's share, the vast majority, not all, but almost all, of the product coming into the United States comes through our ports of entry. Um, and we have made, through the Appropriations Committee, I chair the subcommittee that writes the budget for DHS, some, some, some significant investments in technology at those ports of entry. But there sometimes is an impression here that a lot of this product is being you know, moved across in the dead of the night through the desert. But the reality is we still don't catch as much as we should that is walking straight through public ports of entry. And there's additional investments that we can make to try to catch more of it and ultimately deter more of that activity. Yes, Senator, no, you're correct. So the, the, the preponderance of the drugs do come through the existing ports of entry. Uh, the technology that they have available is very impressive, and the men and women of Customs and Border Protection, those are our most experienced uh, folks on the ground. Um, and it, it, it is the most efficient way to be able to move them across and then have access on the other side to an available network to get them quickly across the country. So uh, they do come through most of the ports of entry. 
Uh, but there is obviously more that we can do. And so, you know, the President's budget asked for $300 million in enhancements for Customs and Border Protection uh, for that very reason that this is an evolving threat. Uh, but there are other places, obviously, through the mail system, through maritime conveyances, that these drugs uh, get into the country as well. I, I just make that point, Madam Chair, because a lot of our colleagues think that by putting up this wall on the border, you're going to stop fentanyl from coming into the country. The reality is fentanyl is coming in through the ports. And so we can make investments, but the idea that it's the, the, un, the unwalled portions of the border where the fentanyl is pouring in is just not what the facts bear out. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Senator Marshall.